Dr. Fatima Muhammad Amin, Senior Research Fellow of the Economic Planning Unit. Yang berbahagia, Dr. Muhammad Anwar Yahya, Senior Executive Director of Price Waterhouse Keepers Malaysia. Mr. Fred Watson, Mr. Yan Lermaretz and other members of PWTC, PWC team. Yang berbahagia, Dato' Dato', Datin Datin, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Good morning and welcome to the stakeholder engagement session for the study on industrial estates development in Malaysia. We are honored and thankful that to have everyone here for taking a time out of your busy schedule to participate in this session. Just to give a brief background to the participants, this, this study was conducted to evaluate the development of the existing industrial estates in Malaysia and also to develop the guidelines as well as physical and financial models for creating a new industrial estate in the future. Hence, the stakeholder engagement session is held today to present the findings of the draft by PwC, which is the consultant, for the study and most importantly, to seek the participants' views or feedback on the proposed development guidelines for industrial estates. To begin with, I will now invite Mr. Darayan for the one session. Thank you, Mr. Dalai. And now, without further ado, it is our pleasure to invite Yang Sir, Dr. Fatima Muhammad Amin, Senior Research Fellow of EPU, to give an opening speech. Thanks so much, Fatima. Morning, Mr. Um, Terima kasih uh, ingin saya mengucapkan uh, ribuan terima kasih kepada bagi Datuk Datuk Datin Datin Pengarah Pengarah uh, IPU uh, Tuan-tuan dan puan-puan kerana dapat meluangkan masa uh, pagi ini untuk bersama-sama kita uh, meneliti um, uh, draft laporan akhir kajian um, Industrial Estate Development Malaysia um, dan uh, untuk Um, sesi pagi ini um, tujuannya ialah juga um, dedication from uh, the various stakeholders uh, mengenai saranan-saranan yang telah dikemukakan oleh pihak pakarunding um, dan supaya uh, uh, apabila kita uh, serahkan uh, laporan ini dan terima oleh kerajaan kita dapat uh, melaksanakan um, saranan-saranan uh, ini dengan lebih uh, teratur dan uh, dan berkesan. Um, just uh, as a background, as mentioned by Cash just now, uh, the um, uh, study was uh, um, started in August last year. Um, dan uh, pada bulan sep 
September hingga November kami telah mengeluarkan uh, uh, suara sendiri untuk mendapat maklumat daripada uh, the various stakeholders uh, mengenai um, kedudukan industri real estate di Malaysia uh, dan uh, pada uh, apa uh, I will take this opportunity untuk uh, mengucapkan ribuan terima kasih kepada uh, semua pihak yang telah memberi kami uh, kerjasama sepanjang uh, 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 kajian ini dilaksanakan uh, dan uh, kami go, uh, apa, um, we appreciate all your feedback although it was uh, um, I would say uh, a very tedious and hard um, uh, you know uh, it was a tough journey for us in the last six months um, to gather all this information and to make some sense out of the situation in Malaysia Maybe uh, um, we have come to the uh, almost to the end of the uh, the study. Um, draft laporan akhir telah pun uh, dikemukakan oleh uh, pakar rundingan. Then I'm going to have really uh, all the stakeholders uh, to give us the final feedback, uh, uh, the final validation of uh, whether the recommendations are uh, um, you know practical. Uh, um, So um, why did we do the study? Um, as you know, um, industrial 
estate is a very uh, important enabler for industrial development. Um, and, uh, um, and, and we have in Malaysia, um, I don't know, uh, in my opinion, it's far too many. Uh, we have almost 600 industrial estates in Malaysia of different forms, different shapes, different, you know, different objectives. Uh, and, but we don't have, nobody in, in Malaysia, no, no agency in Malaysia, be it EPU, be it MIDA, my METI and so on, have a holistic picture of, of industrial estates in Malaysia. Nobody has, has a complete database. So that was something that, uh, you know, uh, part of our study was to uh, initiate this, uh, this data collection. Uh, secondly, there was um, uh, various parties uh, involved in industrial estate development, operation and management. And uh, uh, we, we, our findings see, show that there is no coordination between the various parties. Uh, and as a result, I think uh, the allocation of resources um, is not as uh, efficient as we would like it to be. Uh, there is also uh, uh, no clear definition of, of industrial estates. Um, I think uh, it's, it's fashionable to use, uh, you know, science park, technology park, you know, to, to market your, your uh, industrial land. But, you know, uh, the content is very important, you know, what you your market should be also reflective of what is inside the industrial estate. And we find that uh, as, as we go around the, the country uh, interviewing and looking at the sites, uh, you know, uh, the, the name of the estate and what is um, uh, offered at the estate are sometimes not, uh, not uh, uh, the same. So I think we need to have some more uh, systematic way of, of uh, designating and, and uh, classifying on the state. And, uh, and also, uh, uh, it's very important is uh, multiple overlapping funding. Uh, of course, uh, in, for, for purposes of development, uh, EPU is the main agency that provides the development fund for the industrial estate development and infrastructure. But there's also other uh, sources of funds. We have uh, MOF also gives uh, some funds. Uh, we have the state agencies also have some fund, also uh, private uh, sources of funds. So there are multiple and overlapping uh, um, uh, you know, channeling of funds, and, and I think all these things uh, could be approved. So that was uh, the reason why, uh, the main reason why uh, EPU decided that I think it's time for us to review and take stock of what's happening down uh, on the ground and see how best uh, to move forward and, and improve our um, uh, resource allocation and also to improve the, uh, um, the marketability of our uh, industrial estates uh, in view of the fact that you know there's plenty of competition now I mean maybe uh, um, 30 40 years ago when we started with the uh, free trade zone or free uh, industrial zone in, in Penang there was not much competition but today you know uh, around you Indonesia uh, Vietnam Thailand uh, they are also uh, developing their industrial land in, in a um, perhaps better way and uh, so uh, we face this competition so we really need to uh, market uh, and, and develop our industrial estates in a, in a more uh, systematic and, and improved way. So uh, that was the, the rationale behind the study and um, uh, on that note let me uh, pass it uh, over to Dr. Anwar for the uh, study. Mm -hmm. I think uh, when we talk about industrial estates, uh, management, it's, it's actually it's just like managing a business. Now. When I think about it, before you do a business, you have to do a conduct a feasibility study, a proper feasibility study, looking at the market, looking at the technical layout arrangements. We look at financing. Uh, we look at operationalizing the, the, the business. So, so the first. The first thing is to make sure that we have a proper feasibility study, physical and financial and operational. And then when you think about it, industrial estates is no more, no different from running, as I say, a business. In any business, if you want to succeed, I think there's three things for this, which, which to me are the most important aspects of running a business. Number one is you must have a vision. That means you must know what the industrial estate 
that you are setting up, what is your vision over the next 10, 15 years? How do you want to see the estate develop? What sort of companies do you want to attract? So all that has to be mapped out, the vision. Number two, you must have good people to run it. In any business, if you don't have good people, you can have a great vision, you are never able to operationalize the, uh, the business. So make sure you get a good people to run the business, who understand the dynamics of the business, who understand the interaction with tenants uh, of the business, uh, and, and also understand that this is not just a, a development exercise. It's not just purely developing industrial estates, but actually managing the industrial estates. So that's number two. And number three, of course, uh, in any business to succeed, you must have discipline. So discipline means that you know, you've got to make sure that you have the proper infrastructure systems in place. People are doing what they're supposed to be doing and are being monitored. Um, whether you call it KPIs or whatever, they are being tracked and assessed and, 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 you know, and, and monitored. So as I said, in any business, three things. So for, for industrial estate, you've got to have vision, you've got to have good people, you've got to make sure that you have instilled discipline. And when you talk about management again, it's not, it's not just uh, you develop an industrial estate and then maintain it. Management is much more than just maintaining an industrial estate. It's talking about marketing the thing, looking at the tenant's needs, proactively handling their queries, their requirements, uh, and also financing, making sure that there's enough money to finance the estate. Just like any business. So, and we know that monies are not getting easier in this, in this post-2008 crash. So, uh, even governments around the world, including Malaysia, are expecting people to, to go and look for your own funds. I mean, you are looking for private financing. The word is private financing as opposed to government funding. I think my colleague will be explaining shortly. So uh, the test in future is to make sure that projects that are being put up to the government uh, uh, will need to pass the test of private financing. I think, and it's not only Malaysia, I can tell you, it's all over the world. If we, if we, if we are unable to pass that test, then it's a question of what is the gap that we are talking about. And if the gap uh, is not big, it's not big, and the business makes sense, then I'm sure the government will come in and try to help out. But gone are the days where government will just give you money as and when you ask for it. So I think uh, this is a reality of life. I'm not happy that this is like it, like like, like this, but it's the way things are, are happening. And things will continue like this. And then uh, we talk about industrial estates again. There's uh, 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 besides the financial element, there's also uh, the physical models and what sort of park management models, which my colleagues will be explaining shortly. You know, there are various management models around the world. You've got to decide what models are suitable for what estates. And, and, and then if we, if, we can, if we can do that, share with what's happening around the world, some of their success, some of their failures, then I think we are on the way to, to uh, really uh, come up with uh, proper uh, structures for industrial estates. And then we also know that around the world now, uh, we talk about clustering. Classic example is, of course, uh, Samaraju, where it's the industries that are energy intensive. So whatever industries you are, it doesn't matter. As long as you, you need electricity, uh, uh, lots of electricity, you've got Bakun and all the other dams around Sarawak to be able to offer a very competitive price for your products eventually. So it's a question of what what is what is the cluster that we're talking about? And again, I think Fred 
my colleague, he's, he's, he's an expert in this. I'm sure he can share with you, perhaps, what, what, uh, what it's all about. So anyway, moving on to, sorry, a, a bit of digression, moving on to slide, uh, uh, the next slide. So, yeah, okay, the study, as we say, uh, I'm not going to delve into detail, as uh, Dr. Patima has mentioned earlier, we want to know what is the current status and the performance of the industrial estates that we have right now, and look at some of the challenges as we go ahead. Uh, because at the end of the day, a lot of you are asking for government help. I think the government is in a situation where how do I decide who to help? So there needs to be some criteria in terms of allocation of government funding, which is very fortunate. I mean, as I said, the word government funding, every time you hear government funding, you should be happy because the, uh, the other extreme is private financing. So if there's government funding, uh, it's good, but the government wants to make sure that estates are effectively and efficiently run. And, and, and we are here to, to give advice on some of the best practices on industrial estates. And I mentioned earlier the models, both physical and financial model, and how do we take it forward. Uh, the next slide uh, will be uh, uh, the team. I think we've already uh, introduced the team. Basically, we've got steering committee and technical committee looking at our recommendations. We've got a full team here. I'm, I'm the engagement director with Andrew as a project director. And we've got Jan and Marina as joint project managers. And of course, Dr. Fred Rawson here, who's a subject matter expert with Sakato Kazia. And we've got a full team there. So we, we've been interacting very closely. In fact, I must thank Dr. Patima. She's been a fantastic uh, person to deal with. Uh, the level of energy that she's put into this project is amazing. I've done a lot of government projects, but I've not quite seen someone as uh, uh, dynamic and energetic as she is. And certainly, uh, we will want you to continue <laughs> to be with the government for person of your talents. Okay, with that, I will pass to Dr. Fred, who will run through the next few slides. Right. Good morning. My name is Fred Vossen, and um, as already was mentioned in the introduction, and already mentioned when the team was presented, um, I am from Belgium, as well as my other colleagues from Brussels, capital of Europe. I have spent most of my working life as a partner in PricewaterhouseCoopers, responsible for advice to our clients on their investment decisions. And it is over the years that I have been able to advise hundreds of companies and several hundreds of projects on their global investment decisions uh, around the world, Asian companies, American companies, European companies. It is because of that experience that you are faced with, obviously, the team of Malaysia, PricewaterhouseCoopers Malaysia, and that is the reason why you see these weird Belgians around as well. So Belgium has nothing to do with this. It is a coincidence we are based in Brussels, but our expertise is investment decision making for private companies. And it is um, the approach that we have used to look at industrial estates in Malaysia. And what are they, and how are they, how good are they and how expensive are they is entirely based upon the philosophy or upon the conviction that you can only be successful with something if you develop something that answers the needs of the market, that answers the needs of what the clients are looking for. 
So in this case, let's check, let's have a look at the industrial estates in Malaysia and see is this indeed what investors are looking for. Is this one working better? Yeah. So the the first the first question is what investments are we talking about? And secondly, how are investment decisions made? And the investments we talk about are investments related to manufacturing, to distribution, to even research and development. It's a manufacturing of products. Uh, in all kinds of sectors, in pharmacy, in chemicals, in metals, in whatever you can imagine. Pure manufacturing, also distribution and even R&D. Whether the company is a Malaysian company, an American company, a Japanese company, European-based company, that does not matter. The companies are all trying to achieve the same thing. They will invest money, and they expect a return on investment. They want to see the money back that they have invested, and on top of that, they want to have a little more than the investment made by themselves. Now, a first little definition. The only investments we talk about are mobile investments. This means that when the company identifies the need for new manufacturing capacity, they have a certain choice in where to locate this new manufacturing capacity. If you produce vegetables and um, something that really has to be produced very close to the market because it's perishable, there is no choice in whether I can locate in Malaysia or in China or in Bavaria, Germany. You have to be extremely close to your market. This is a non-mobile investment. As Malaysian government, you can do everything and anything you want in order to attract such an investment. It will always fail because the investment has to be extremely close to where the market is. You can have that because things are very perishable or you can have that because transport cost is going to be too expensive or transport is going to be too difficult. If, for example, you produce empty cans for Coca-Cola, you produce those empty cans very close to where they are needed in the market. You don't produce them in China for a European market because transporting air is the most expensive thing on earth. If you transport potatoes for chip manufacturing, that is a very costly thing. So similarly, there are projects that have to be very close to the raw materials. A cement plant is very close to where the raw material is found. Those are the projects that are not of interest to us. The projects that are of interest to us are those that have a certain liberty and freedom in choosing the location, and they choose the location based upon mainly two criteria, two main criteria. First of all, when a company identifies the need for a new unit, for a new manufacturing unit, they will make, like everybody, a project definition. They will say, what will we make? How much will we make? And what do we need in order to do that? How much land, what buildings, how many people, how much utilities, power, water, so forth. And from that project definition, they start by identifying a long list of possible locations. And finally, they will come to a short list and afterwards to negotiations and a decision. Now the two main subjects in the evaluation, one has to do with the quality of operating conditions, the ease of doing business, how easy is it, how good is the location in terms of quality. If I go to the center of Africa, maybe I have very, very cheap labor, but I don't have infrastructure, I don't have transportation, I don't even have utilities properly, and therefore, that is a very difficult environment to work in. If I go to the center of Germany, I have all the highways, the ports, the people, the universities I can imagine. That's the quality of operating conditions. The second subject is the 
cost efficiency of the location. The second subject has to do with money, has to do with dollars, and has to do with how much do I have to invest and how much can I get as a return. Now, it is in fact not correct to say the first subject and the second subject because they go hand in hand. The first one is equally important as the second one. The second one is equally important as the first one. They go hand in hand. Now, when a company looks at the cost structures of Malaysia and compares those cost structures with China or with Vietnam or any other location, there are two parts in the equation. First is what they invest. It has to do with land cost, building cost, equipment cost, and working capital. Secondly, it has to do with operational cost. It has to do with labor cost, transport cost, utility cost, taxes to be paid, and finally, how much profit is left and how much cash flow is left. Where does the original cash flow come from? From the inflow of what they sell. The inflow of what they sell over the years is the money-making stream number one. From that are deducted all the costs. Then you are left with the net profit. If you adjust for capital allowances, you end up with a cash flow. The fundamental for any company is to have after a number of years, the lifetime of the project, 10 years, 15 years, eight years, whatever the project is looked at in terms of number of years, the future cash flows growth at value of today's money, that's what we call this kind of cash flows, have to be minimum as much as the original investment made. This is very simple logic, no rocket science, we have to be able to make the same money than what we have invested, and that's the minimum, because if it's only to make the money back, what are we doing? We want to make a little more back. Now, in the report and in the presentation, you will hear many times profitability index. Profitability index is a nice word that you may remember from your university years. It is nothing else but the sum of the discounted future cash flows of what a project is able to make in the future divided by the original investment. And if the equation is that we want to find back our original investment, the profitability index obviously has to be minimum one. If it's not one, it's a bad idea and it will never work and it will never fly. <coughs> Secondly, what you have to understand is attracting investment, whether it's Malaysian or American or Japanese, is a very, very sad story because there is only one winner. There is one project and finally the project locates in one country, in one location. They compare many countries, many locations, many regions, many industrial states, there is only one winner. The second place brings you nothing. In other words, you have to be better than the competition. That is why in the report, throughout the report, when we look at industrial estates, we always look at those quality related issues of operating conditions in combination with cost structures and is there a good potential for that project to make a return on investment. And that is why for Malaysia, for a certain industrial estate, the profitability index of one project does not only have to be bigger than one, you have to be as high as possible, hopefully the highest in profitability index in comparison with the competition. And if you're not the highest, okay, let it be, but then it has to be compensated by your quality of operating environment. The loser is the one that does not offer a return on investment for the industrial project. In other words, the loser is the one with a low profitability index and a low quality environment to operate. The winner is the opposite. So I give you this background again because the entire <coughs> approach is based upon let's do something in Malaysia that answers the needs 
of the demand side that answers the needs of what the market wants, that answers the needs of what the industrial of what industrialists want. Now, I have to explain you a little specialty in this total business. What I just explained to you, the potential return of investment for a project in Malaysia, that in fact reflect, reflects the pricing of Malaysia. If I say this project in pharmaceuticals can get a profitability index of 2.3, that reflects in one figure the cost structures of Malaysia, the pricing of what Malaysia is all about for this type of investment. This is not to be confounded, this is not the same as the price of land of an industrial estate. Many times people make the mistake in thinking that the price of land of the industrial estate reflects the pricing position the competitive position of that industrial estate with others. To say that it has nothing to do with it is not true. The price of land is in the equation of return on investment for a private initiative, one component. It is even one component of the investment cost. Land cost, building equipment, working capital, that's the investment cost. The others are labor cost, transport cost, utility cost, tax, and so forth. The land cost of the industrial estate is only one element in the total competitive positioning or in the total pricing of an industrial estate or in the total pricing of a country or a region. On the other hand, the price of land that you get from an industrial estate, obviously, is the key element in whether an industrial estate makes money or loses money. Makes money and everybody's happy, or loses money and we have to find somewhere money from the government that we spend in order to make it work. So the relationship between the price of land, industrial estate, and price of land as one element in the project costing is a very important equation and during the presentation, we will come back to it in more detail. This is something that you have to watch. Why? Because a lot of money can be made in this equation. If the price of land is not at all important in the return on investment of a project, you can increase the price of land of an industrial estate because it will not affect your competitive position. That is what we have referred to in the report as upward pricing potential. If you look at extremely capital intensive projects, like in the chemical, in the petrochemical, and so forth, in the total arithmetic of return on investment of those projects, land cost is marginal. So even if your competitors charge whatever dollars per square foot, if you charge more, it does not harm your competitive position because it does not harm the potential for a return of investment for that project. On the other hand, if you have a very land intensive project, like for example, many distribution centers, and if you increase land cost by 5%, you may kill the project. If you increase it by 30%, the project is definitely dead. In those cases, there is no upward potential in pricing. Now, why is this upward potential in pricing? Why is this relationship between price of land and how it affects your competitive position so important? That is because of what my colleagues just mentioned. That has to do with where does the money come from? That has to do with financing. And I have to, I will try to explain um, a couple of words and a couple of definitions and we can always change definition and always change words but there is a definition between financing and funding if I have a project and the cost of the project is 100 and over a number of years 
I can find the 100 back because I generate, for example, 10 times 10 equal at 100. I can always find financing for this project, especially if the project not only brings me 100, but if the project brings me 130. The cost is 100, the project brings 130, I will find financing with banks, with private investors. Everybody will be happy because they know that there will be more cash flows in the future than capex is needed in the present. If I have a project with a cost of 100, and I look at it in the future, and I only find back 70 in the future, I have a gap of 30. That gap needs to be funded. It can be, there will be no private company that comes forward and says, guys, here is the 30. Because no one wants to lose 30. Only the government can come with the 30. Why would the government be so stupid to, win, to put in 30 into a project of an industrial estate or of another infrastructure, port or whatever, if the cost is 100 and it only brings back 70. The government can do that for very good macroeconomic reasons because there will be employment created, those people will be taxpayers, because there will be a company that pays taxes and so forth. There will be value added created. So even if there is a gap, yes, it could be possible that it makes sense for a government to come with financing, <coughs> funding. Funding, let's call it, for the ease of conversation, funding, it's closing the gap that is needed because there is a difference between cash flows in the future and investments in the present. Obviously, you feel that the gap cannot be illimited. The gap should be reasonable. The gap should be such that we can find other revenues for the government, return to government value added, that accounts for closing the gap and for coming with the funding. I'm, I'm sorry that I, I took so much time on one slide. Believe me, the rest will go much faster. But there's a number of things I wanted to make clear. You cannot be successful with industrial estates if you don't develop a product that answers the needs of the market. And the needs of the market relate to return on investment cost structures and quality of operating conditions. And secondly, be careful in what the price of land is because to you, to industrial estates and the government, it is the key income line for the industry that comes. It is only one element and you should check the elasticity of price of land in the return of investment and see whether there is a source to generate more money and therefore limit, the, limit the government funding. I will now hand over to Jan, to my colleague, for the full details <coughs> on conclusions, approach, recommendations. Uh, we do realize that what we are trying to do today is not fair. We will be presenting a limited number of slides, a huge amount of work, for which again, indeed, I thank you. Not only my colleagues, but also the government, the people that were involved. We had a tremendous support. <coughs> Impossible for us to do this job as twice or else. It was only it was only possible because of the support. Yeah. Thank you. Through the different steps that uh, we've gone through uh, with the MIT and, and um, with the uh, EPU um, in order to come to all of the conclusions we're sharing today. And um, I think one of the, uh, the first statements was that uh, there's an, a large number of industrial estates in this country and, and therefore we could not visit all of them. We could not um, use data on all of them. Um, it would have been great if, if, if that would have been possible but then we probably would have met in 2015, we would not have met today. And um, because we wanted to meet today, and because uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, we could come up with a number of uh, good conclusions, we first of all started the exercise by collecting information on what we called uh, was a sample of uh, the industrial states. Um, with that sample, and you may recall that we've gone through the details of uh, how we uh, defined that sample, um, where we presented some intermediate um, uh, results, um, with that sample, we're really trying to be um, 
um, as um, representative as possible. So it was um, a sample of uh, different types of industrial states. It was a sample of uh, industrial states with different level of uh, maturity, with uh, different type of targets, uh, with di different geographical locations. Um, in, in 39 uh, industrial states in the end uh, will be retained in that sample. And a lot of the data that we collected through questionnaires and, and through interaction with industrial state uh, developers and authorities involved was then used uh, in this study. Um, we used it at uh, three levels to start with. Uh, first of all, we looked at the industrial states um, with the entire rationale that uh, Fred just explained. So we, uh, we kind of uh, tested these industrial states for the identified target industries. We kind of uh, put on our heads of uh, being uh, prospective uh, investors and we started doing the analysis. Um, with our projects in mind, with uh, all the, uh, the technical as well as the financial requirements of these projects, we um, did the analysis and uh, tried to understand um, how competitive the industrial states in Malaysia uh, were, um, how they positioned on their uh, ease of doing business for the targets, or how they positioned on uh, the financial returns they allowed the industries to, ge uh, to generate. And we also did that in comparison with a number of selected uh, international benchmark locations. Now these benchmark locations um, were selected in the wider region, just to make sure that uh, first of all we came up with a number of uh, um, interesting uh, conclusions on the competitive position of uh, the country as a whole, but also to make sure that once again we reflected the um, what we call the investors form of view that uh, when the industrialist selects his long list, he typically will do that in, in, in a region or in a number of countries which allow for similar type of uh, operating uh, conditions. And, and so with that element in mind, um, we did a comparison, we did against Thailand, China, um, Indonesia, um, Singapore, other countries. Um, all of that allowed for conclusions on what we call the financial performance um, of the industrialist. And so that's a bit of the first pillar you see on the slide. Um, that is what helped us understand the performance of the country. Second element that we looked at with all the data that we collected was what we call the governance. Um, how is industrial state development government in this country? Which are the uh, parties involved? Uh, what's their role? What are their responsibilities? How do they go about the, the development from concept phase all the way down to uh, operating the industrial state? And um, what are the cash flows? The cash flows in this particular situation, the cash flows of the industrial state developers. So the other side of the equation is just explained. And, and in that equation, we already mentioned it, there's this link with um, the cost of the industries being the top line of the industrial state developer. Um, and there's this element uh, that leads into the funding. So that explains how we came to the second and the work, uh, third work stream in what we call the gap analysis. That was really where we looked at all of these elements, made sure that we clearly understood what's happening in this country, that we could put everything in perspective, and um, that we had a number of uh, uh, conclusions that would help us, or a number of principles, intermediate findings that would help us drive um, in the strategy formulation. <coughs> then um, we've been presenting these kind of intermediate findings to you, and you may recall that uh, we met um, a couple of months back and, and reported on our progress as well as on these findings, and that we had discussions with you. Um, we first of all had discussions in terms of uh, um, what we found uh, to be the situation. We also had discussions with you in terms of how you could help us make a better strategy. And um, so we interacted with um, as many as you as possible. Uh, we also came to visit some of your industrial states, interacted with your, uh, um, your tenants, your, your clients, um, and interacted with a number of the, uh, what we call to be the, 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 the stakeholders, people who are involved, people that help define your environment and therefore have an impact on Position. We also uh, looked at uh, the, the, the Malaysian development context and, and there's a number of uh, frameworks, there's a number of, uh, of, of programs that run in this country and they all impact on, on, on our position, they all impact on, on what we see to be uh, the future. Um, we do not want to reinvent the wheel, we do not want to be smarter than what already has been developed um, and so we, we looked at all of these programs and made sure that uh, when we came up with new ideas that those ideas fit into the overall strategy and, and that they all together become uh, uh, components in, 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 in a strengthening uh, um, element. So that was um, 
where we looked at the environment and development framework. And we also uh, wanted to make sure that uh, um, this being a game of international competition, that we understood and we actually learned from uh, what others have done or what others were doing. Um, so we looked at the international uh, competitive environment. We uh, to uh, to literature harvesting as well as to interaction based upon our experience working in these countries as well. We came up with a number of uh, elements that uh, we felt uh, could easily uh, influence the situation in Malaysia, could, could easily uh, allow um, for um, a documented uh, type of strategy building. And so there was the international um, evidence uh, that we brought together. All of that helped us understand that um, there was a number of real critical elements uh, in terms of financing and funding, in terms of industrial uh, develop, industrial state development in this country. And uh, those have helped us uh, to create conclusions. Those have helped us to create uh, recommendations uh, towards CPU. And uh, those recommendations had to do with two elements. They first of all uh, had to do with uh, the element of financing in itself, the clear scope of this study. But they also had to do with some of uh, the conditions, the, the business environment, the, uh, the, the um, surrounding uh, conditions but that have clear influence on um, the performance of the industrial state from a financial or non-financial perspective. And we kind of bundled those together as well. And that is really what uh, created the three thick volumes of a report. And uh, it's not about the quantity of the pages, it's about the quality of the content. Um, and we've been discussing this at length. Uh, Totally as well as uh, with EPU and, and throughout uh, the interaction, we uh, we try to come up with uh, as strong as possible recommendations, as strong as possible conclusions, um, and strong in this sense is uh, how to strengthen the position, uh, how to make uh, the industrial uh, estate landscape uh, even more performant than, than it is today. So that's a bit in a nutshell how uh, we've been working together uh, with EPU over the last couple of months. And uh, what we see today, uh, as Fred already mentioned, is um, um, a, um, a summary of, of all of these findings. And, and I invite you uh, to take a weekend off, to take the report with you, and uh, to enjoy the reading. Um, and, and if there's any comments, any questions, obviously uh, feel free uh, to contact us, and uh, we'll gladly uh, discuss them with you. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that uh, there was a bit of a teaser for that weekend, and that teaser is today in uh, in the summary of, uh, of the report that we bring to you. So um, I allow uh, the word now to Andrew, I'll pass the word to Andrew, we, Andrew will uh, guide us through a number of uh, the, uh, the earlier uh, blocks of the study um, where um, we will share with you uh, the basis of our analysis and, and how we came out to the various conclusions. Thank you, thank you, Jan. Uh, I, I think just to clarify, I, I don't think the participants in this session are uh, as the report. After we pass the steering column, I'm sure we'll, we'll get a copy to you uh, that is finalized. What I'm going to share is uh, some findings and, and some feedback that we got uh, when we did the questionnaire. Um, we also did some strategy formulation immediately after the interim report. <coughs> we, as uh, Jan mentioned, we went on some site visits to gather information as well as to get feedback from SEDCs, from tenants, uh, etc. So I'll share some of that. Uh, before we find, before we come to the conclusion section. So just to explain, as, as Doc and as my colleagues here have, have, have mentioned, we have 595 industrial estates. And I must say that the plan initially was, was to select a short list of 100 industrial estates. Once we have information about the 100, we will then select 50, which is representative of industrial estates in Malaysia, both in terms of the sector, in terms of the regional, in terms of where they are in, in, in their evolution, whether they are a startup, uh, whether they are maturing, uh, etc. Uh, and then we'll do the analysis on the 50 so that we can then uh, base the conclusions uh, from, from those 50. As, as Jan says, uh, we, we can't do 595, uh, we'll do 50. But uh, the disappointing part for me is that we didn't even get the 50. So you will see that, that out of 595, we eventually chose uh, not 100. As we set out in our in our study scope, we chose 112, um, and then we sent these 112 questionnaires, which were quite detailed. And taking on from where Dr. Fred Watson mentioned, this is what investors are looking for. So 
So the information that we, we ask are not just nice for the study, but investors would want this uh, when they do the initial filter as well as the detailed filter. Um, and, and we came from that perspective. Um, and after much chasing, uh, we only got 39. And of the 39, uh, we got very, very little financial information about how industrial estates uh, were, uh, were, were financially managed uh, and no information about uh, operations and, and maintenance uh, expenditure. So we had difficulty making analysis. We had to do some of the proxies, uh, but uh, that was the starting point. So with the 39, uh, if you decided to, to proceed, so it's, it's not as representative uh, in terms of the, of, of the spread as, 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 as I just mentioned. So some of the findings, if I can go through, um, the 39 had all the 12 uh, sectors that MIDA is prioritizing. Um, there was no systematic alignment of industrial estates development. So states and industrial estates were developed uh, not, in an, uh, not coordinated. So we have states which were developing industrial estates, we were competing with other states. So as a result, in the third bullet, you can see that the, the industrial estate score varies. Some are attractive because they are in a good location, they've got good uh, ease of doing business and their cost is very uh, competitive from an investor's point of view. Some will develop and actually when you compete against international industrial estates as well as the other fellow industrial estates in Malaysia, they lose out. So the scores are very different uh, for the various uh, target sectors. Uh, as uh, Fred mentioned, this is the, the, the point where he mentioned that uh, there are upward bank pricing potential for some industrial estates. There is the ability to uh, increase the price and this investor will still come. Because the investor will negotiate very tough and they will say that they, they, they have other locations they want to go to uh, and if only you you give me a better pricing will come. But actually they've already decided that, uh, that even if you increase the price, they will still come to you. <coughs> even if you don't give them the incentives, they will still come to you. But you don't know that. I wonder how many industrial estates know what, what the investor's uh, position is. You know, we only look at it from <coughs> the industrial estate. But from the investor's perspective, do we know who what they are talking to? Uh, what are the cost structures? How much, how much can we uh, give away and, and make them come if we don't know? Uh, uh, as I mentioned, there's no financial information data and, uh, that we see for, for 39. We had one or two, but still not sufficient uh, to base uh, any conclusions for, for this study. Um, no public private partnership models uh, were denoted. Uh, I think basically because the financial information was not there. We can see whether or not it makes sense, uh, for example, to, uh, to see how it was managed from a cost perspective, from an operational perspective. The last point is also important because we spend so much time, this is, this is from, first of all, in industrial estate perspective. For one industrial estate, you have to go and see many, many people to get the information from development uh, through to uh, who, they, who they, they use to market as well as the cost information, the PBTs, uh, and also from the overall perspective, if you realize 595, we need a, a sort of a, a full-time group of people to be, to be managing and developing uh, and heating, breathing industrial estates, which we don't at the moment. My dad is close to it, uh, so, uh, but they, there are offices are not heating, breathing industrial estates. So that's slide 10. Um, slide 11, just to say that uh, we had uh, a stakeholder session immediately after the interim report. Um, for the feedback, uh, we visited industrial estates. Uh, this was some of the feedback from uh, the site visit that we, we, we made. Uh, Again, as, as Jan said, we, we couldn't go to, to all of them, uh, but we did as much as we could during the study period. Uh, and some of the feedback that we got, uh, which we call for findings, is uh, having a dedicated park manager with a defined role is, uh, 
is an important factor for investors and the tenants in the investor estate. Uh, they're, they're prepared to pay uh, extra uh, if, if uh, having good quality car management uh, is available. They, they want you to engage early with them uh, so there are no surprises. Uh, and everything is, can be as much as possible anticipated beforehand. And they also mentioned about this human capital development and SME support, which, uh, which is an is, is important part of uh, industry, industrial estate offering. Um, so, and then I'll go to the, 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 my last slide, uh, which is uh, taken from the EPP GDP. And the point I want to stress here is the, the last box about the principles of uh, the EPP. I think that's so, and, and, and my, my fellow colleagues around the table here has already mentioned, which is allocating funding to achieve the highest impact. Yeah. Uh, uh, which is looking at public funding, which is prioritized by GNI impact, which uh, at the moment industrial estates is not looked at it, it's mainly looked at from uh, FDI, how much FDI can we attract. So we don't look at calculating exactly how much employment is created. <coughs> In terms of the tax revenue loss from incentives, uh, how much are we making back in, in other areas of value added, as, as, he had, as Fred mentioned? Um, so these are good principles which we want to uh, adopt uh, in, in industrial estates, uh, uh, in this industrial estate study. Uh, transparency, um, and then this first is quality performance. So you will see later that uh, the tool that we have is uh, it's, it's a circular tool where uh, if you do well and uh, you bring in the investors, then uh, uh, you, when, when you come and look at the second round of uh, funding, then your past performance will be taken into account. So this first according to performance, both in terms of getting the funding and, and uh, making sure that the, the, the money is being used uh, correctly, then, and then when uh, we have to get funding for the second round or for another industrial estate, then this will all be taken into account. So that's all I have uh, to share in terms of the feedback, the findings from uh, what was what we got from the questionnaires, uh, the meetings that we had, the feedback that we had with the industrial estates, the strategy for administration session, um, and what uh, is important from the EPP in terms of uh, uh, allocating funding to achieve the highest impact. Uh, I pass it back to Jack. Okay, thank you, Andrew. And I said before, I mean, it was this other element that we looked at um, what, what are others doing, what can we find in terms of um, international studies, and what can we find in terms of international evidence. And obviously, I mean, the, the idea was not to write the Britannica and industrial states. Um, the idea was really to, to focus on those elements uh, which we found in, in, in our previous uh, parts of the study to be uh, interesting ones and to be particular ones for the uh, for Malaysia. So we kind of focused on three elements which are related to the policy making and the policy implementation in, in Malaysia on industrial states one hand. Second one was uh, all these elements that we could see that uh, would impact on uh, the attractiveness of the industrial state. And then the last one uh, had to do with, uh, with the management of uh, the industrial state management in the broad sense of the word, as uh, as I've already explained in, uh, in the introduction. Now um, on, on the policy one, and I'll, uh, I'll quickly highlight the um, most important ones, is that uh, what we see is that uh, industrial state development ideally uh, should be embedded in, in, in a larger policy. Obviously, um, with um, the, um, the, the different um, um, corridors with the states, with uh, the, the, the local communities being involved in industrial state development, um, to, uh, to link industrial uh, policy, which is at the country level, at the federal level, to industrial state development. Uh, is definitely an element of challenge. The best ambassadors and the best strategists for their local community um, and, and for their ideas on industrial state development, you want to allow for that. At the same time, you want to make sure that in the end it all is coordinated and, um, and also we're, we're not creating too much of the same. Um, now, important element there um, in, in terms of policy making. Also, you want to make sure that um, with um, the supply of loans, you actually answer um, to the demands of the market. Um, and, um, and, and there, clearly, we think that the demand of the market has set. 
where industrial is initially will look at the region and only will look at the country level, and, and later on will uh, we'll look at the industrial states. Uh, you have to make sure that the positioning of the country uh, is important and that that positioning of the country and then later on um, translated in, in the creation of industrial states that that is nicely aligned. On the attractiveness of set on the demand side, uh, these elements uh, come back. Um, and, and there clearly the industrial state is what we call the fiscal technical component in the overall equation. Uh, we've mentioned before that there's the business environment, the labor market, uh, the policy elements, there's the, the regulations, there's um, the utilities, etc. All of these uh, come together in the equation of uh, the, the company when looking at a location. Uh, industrial state is, is one of those elements. And we can look at industrial states from all sorts of ways. We can group them, and uh, there's different types of uh, industrial states uh, that are uh, being uh, created in this country. Uh, we also looked at the evidence around the world uh, on, on that element. And then um, there's the way you can market it, and uh, the marketing can be done in all sorts of ways. You can create uh, websites. You can try to push as much information on the, uh, the, 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 the web as possible. Uh, that has an impact on uh, on how you're being perceived. It also has an impact on how you can later on interact with your investors. Uh, we feel uh, we're ambassadors of more face-to-face -face and more direct interaction, uh, as we think that that creates opportunities. That's also what we see around the world. Um, and then in terms of the development, what we see is that uh, we make uh, development decisions today for the industrial state that uh, will exist for uh, uh, a number of decades. Um, Flexibility then clearly becomes a very important element. Uh, what were the demands of uh, the industrialists uh, 10 years back? It's no longer uh, the case today. And we have to make sure that if we develop something uh, um, that uh, needs to answer uh, their demands for a number of years, that uh, we can do so. So that really brought us to uh, the summary of conclusions that we would like to share with you. Um, all of that work has said uh, captured in, in, in the report and, and shared uh, um, with, uh, with the, 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 the client allowed us to come up with five key messages. And those messages have to do um, with the situation as we see it today, and those messages have to do with how we think uh, the situation can be uh, strengthened uh, going forward. The first clear conclusion was that there's an oversupply of industrial state land in this country. And uh, we will later on uh, put that oversupply in perspective, but clearly um, this country is not short in uh, industrial states. Second element had to do with the, uh, um, the, the position and how the mountain supply interacts. And we kind of felt like the uh, built and the come approach, uh, which uh, we've noticed uh, in a number of locations, is probably not the best way of uh, making uh, the mountain supply interact. Also, in terms of the financing, um, we could not find the evidence that there is a strong push for optimization. And uh, clearly uh, we think that, uh, as explained earlier on, industrial state development is a business. It's a very important business and it uh, requires business rationale um, and also business uh, constraints. And uh, optimization of uh, the financing is clearly an element that will help there. We also noticed that there's um, a lot of um, um, different uh, authorities and, and different agencies involved in industrial state development and management um, and in the promotion and the marketing of it. And that probably doesn't help um, to, to get it all coordinated and to make sure that policy and development are nicely uh, going hand in hand. So we made some recommendations there. And, and clearly also in terms of the financials and the reporting, um, when it comes down to funding and um, the monitoring of it, uh, we could not find a level of transparency that uh, we feel, feel uh, is supportive for all of that. So we will detail these um, five main conclusions in, in the next couple of slides. And um, we start with the oversupply element. Um, and there I, I quickly like to share with you uh, an, an, uh, an element that uh, some industrialists uh, that uh, we brought to Malaysia recently shared with us. They kind of uh, talked about Malaysia as uh, the hidden treasure. Um, in the sense that um, once they were in the country, once they saw all these industrial states, once they uh, talked to the government, to the utility companies, when, when they were studying the labor market, they all felt that these elements nicely lined up. They could find the quality that they were looking for, and they could find it at a, a cost level that was very attractive to them. 
The only unfortunate thing about it was that they had not known about it. If it wasn't for the fact that a site selection consultant had told them about it, um, they had no perception about Malaysia. And what we feel is that uh, to be unknown is, is probably the biggest challenge. Um, and um, so this industrial state landscape, this country clearly has all of the advantages. And we see great opportunity for further development. It's just that um, it's a hidden treasure for the time being to a lot of companies uh, around the world. And, and that's something that we feel uh, can be changed. But then to come back to the element of, of oversupply, we kind of uh, put things in perspective a bit. And uh, we looked at the uh, land take up uh, over the last couple of years. And if we uh, would, uh, just for the 39 industrial states and for the data that we received, um, put the available land in perspective to what we see to be the demand, um, recent demand in this country, and actually just in that sample, we see supply for seven years to come. Now, taking into account that we have data on approximately 5% of the industrial states in this country, one could argue that with the available land today, you're in place, you're in the business for the next 140 years. Now, that's a lot. And we don't know whether that is really needed. Um, now, put it even further in perspective, bring it from the number of years to value, um, and we just did a very straightforward multiplication with 20 rand per square foot uh, on industrial estate land. There's a land bank with a value of 50 plus billion ringgit um, in this country. And, and that's a number that I think uh, attracts attention around the world. And that's the kind of number that makes people uh, get their eyebrows going. And, and I think there's uh, an element here uh, uh, that's a value, that's a treasure. It shouldn't be hidden, first of all. Um, but also that's, that's an awful lot of money and it should be activated in, in the best possible way and, and, and this kind of investment um, requires attention from, uh, from, from a management perspective, also from a financing perspective. Um, what we saw is, uh, and it has been mentioned before, that there's clear upward pricing potential. We kind of feel that oversupply potentially is creating an element of what we see to be internal competition different industrial states in the same country competing one against the other to try and get the, the project. Um, this country should not be competing internally. This country should be competing with the outside world. As many projects as possible should come to Malaysia. Um, and therefore, uh, we should take out the element of internal competition and we should rather be focusing on upward pricing potential. The more money you get in, the easier it will be to get your financing and easy it will be to be self-sustainable from a financial perspective. And there's upward pricing potential, clearly. In, in some of the studies we've done, in, in some of the analysis we've done, where we uh, put on our head of uh, an industrialist and uh, where we tested your country for a number of projects, we saw that if you uh, do the comparison against Thailand, um, for instance, in a good number of cases, there was upward pricing potential of a really great uh, amount. <coughs> And on average, we could easily say that there is some three times the price that could be asked, 300% of the pricing potential. That's an awful lot. Um, and private sector involvement, it has been mentioned before, we see it as a further strengthening element. Uh, private sector involvement is not going to happen unless we, uh, we allow them to make returns, and unless we, uh, we, we, we create the kind of returns that uh, are more common in the private sector. Uh, but with 300 percent pricing, uh, upward pricing potential, those conditions are easily met. Now, the second element relates to this uh, built and labeled comp situation, and that is clearly where we want to change um, the, um, some, of, some of the thinking, where we want to change the underlying rationale, rather than uh, do it on a supply driven uh, basis, where we say, look, there's land, there's good ideas, let's develop the land, and then we will see who will come. We think that uh, there should be land developed to make sure that um, that land um, is being developed with all of the industrialists' ideas in mind. As said, there's already an awful lot of land, so the question is, should we be developing more land? I think that uh, if we match demand and supply, I don't think we should be developing more land, but we should be developing the right kind of land. And it may well be that uh, um, there's oversupply in, in, in certain types of land. There may well be need to develop new land but then the new land should be developed for those projects which seem to be making best sense 
those projects which uh, we think we want to attract, the projects that are in line with the industry policy of this country, the economic development uh, policy of this country. And so let the market define what we build. Let's not build because we think we have the land. Um, because also there's a lot of money that then goes into creating these industrial states and that money should generate a return, that money should be well spent. Fred explained before that if we go to the funding level, the government can afford to spend money where we don't have the financial returns as we would like to see them. But then there should be other reasons why we do it. Um, but we cannot do it just because there is land. Um, we should uh, try to make sure that uh, we develop something which is needed and which ultimately makes best sense in the market. And when we, we, we then talk about this financing and we talk about the, the funding uh, situation, we kind of feel that uh, this, this element of uh, industrial state is a business, um, requires the introduction or, or, the, or the further deepening of business cases. Um, a business case is a very common instrument in a, in a private sector initiative, it's a very common uh, instrument um, in any type of business. And we think that uh, a business case should be complete. A business case should not be just about we need to acquire the land uh, and we need to develop the land, we need to prepare the land for future tenants. No, it should also be about all these services that our future tenants uh, require from us. And there we should be um, um, aligned. We should uh, try to put a product in the market that stands out. At the same time, we should not be putting a product in the market that is over sophisticated. Um, we, um, we've seen initiatives where uh, uh, pre-water treatment, where uh, hazmat product handling, where um, very special conditions for very uh, unique tenants um, are being developed. Um, well, when we develop these kind of uh, elements, we think uh, we, we can strengthen our product and, and, and as such it's a good idea. But let's also make sure that we then charge for these costs, that we charge for the investments that we make as industrial state developers, and that we charge that at market rates. Um, a lot of these products are available in the market. There's a lot of uh, private sector suppliers that actually come up with these services or products, and they charge a price because they feel that they should be generating a decent return. I think there's nothing wrong with generating a decent return as an industrial state developer either, especially not if, if we're supporting business and if we're supporting private business where shareholder value is uh, clearly on top of the agenda. Um, so let's make sure that uh, as an industrial state we, uh, we make our business case. We clearly line up what our costs are, what our capital investments are. We make sure that we report on that um, in a transparent and in an open way. Um, and that we put ourselves a number of KPIs in terms of, uh, of our performance. So that uh, if we uh, want to make a case for funding, um, that we can actually show that um, the funding is needed because there's a gap left and that we ultimately try to uh, minimize that gap as much as possible, uh, but at least um, that uh, we allow for, uh, for monitoring, that we allow for uh, um, some, some reporting on that. And um, that all that intelligence, I think, then should not just be uh, used to, uh, to, to be stored somewhere. Not the intelligence that we collect um, as a result of that should actually allow the country to, to, uh, to, to create a, a database, to create um, uh, intelligence and, and, and guidance on, on how to best invest in industrial states. Uh, we should be learning from each other and uh, the best practices uh, should be rewarded and uh, others should actually uh, get some guidance from uh, people who are doing well. And I think that that also is a conclusion that we, of, of our study. We do see a number of industrial states in this country that really are well managed, that are, um, are doing well in terms of their, their operations as well as their finance. And, and it should be good that uh, we can spell out uh, to the entire uh, sector who is doing uh, well and actually uh, that we can learn from that and, and create some synergies at that level. In terms of um, the, the analysis, we've, we've been focusing a lot on how can we make industrial states um, financially self-sustainable and, and the typical focus then would be like, uh, let's focus on their costs, let's focus on their pricing levels, let's make sure we uh, we, we, we bring those elements uh, nicely in line. Another element uh, that we could focus on could be, well, uh, let's try to make sure that there's uh, more demand for their product. And, uh, and there clearly we've seen that uh, with the number of agencies and with the number of uh, organizations that are involved in, in the marketing, in the broadest sense of the world, uh, world as 
such as you know, pro uh, defining the product, setting the price, doing the promotion. Um, there's, there's, there's probably um, a lot of good work, there's a lot of good actions, um, but there's also a need for, inter uh, for interaction and coordination. Um, we see examples around the world where single organizations are responsible for the policy making, the, uh, the policy development, the coordination of their private sector uh, um, initiatives and, and, and private sector developments. Um, we see situations around the world where this is very scattered. We do think that the better cases are in a more coordinated um, league and, and, and we think that there's probably opportunity there um, for a single authority in, in this country to be created uh, to take up some of that initiative. At the same time, they should allow for those who know their locations best to create ideas, um, but it should be coordinated. We should not all be targeting the same type of um, uh, projects. We should be targeting those projects which are best in our locations. And clearly there are regional differences in this country. But all of these regional differences have their unique strengths. They also have their unique weaknesses. And we should be making sure that with industrial estate, estate development, we actually focus on the strengths and do not create supply, which is actually uh, more linked to our weaknesses. Um, the local authorities uh, at this point in time are, are given a lot of responsibility in terms of maintenance and, and maybe that is not doing just to, to their situation. Maybe you should actually see industrial states as very strong components in that local environment but as very strong components that should be managed on their own and to a certain extent we, we kind of plead for uh, um, the creation of, of, of a, an organization that takes care of the maintenance of the day to day operations can very much be a, an, an organization at state level. Um, but for that organization to get the financial means as well, to actually do maintenance and to do these operations in the best possible way, um, and, and not to uh, to do some of those elements with uh, the local communities. Also, that park manager um, can be a private sector player if, if uh, it is felt that that is a, a better uh, organization or a better party to do it. But we don't think that that by default should be, should be the situation. We do see uh, situations in this country where uh, it's done well uh, and it's done by, uh, by, by, by the public side. So um, that, that kind of uh, sums together the, the conclusions we came, uh, came up with in terms of the uh, different levels and the different type of authorities that are involved in the marketing and development. As said, we, we also had some conclusions on the transparency in the financial position, the financial performance, uh, of these industrial estates. Um, and once again, an important element here, we, we started off with, uh, with a sample and we had actually hoped um, to collect more information um, on, on the financials um, because we think more information would have allowed uh, for a better understanding. Um, we did not get the opportunity to, uh, to collect financial information from all of the 39. Um, it was not always shared, it may have not been available. Um, may not, be, not have been available at the level of detail um, and therefore it may not have been shared, we don't know. Um, what we did find was that uh, for those who shared information, there was uh, great, uh, all, all great differences between um, um, similar cost components. There was uh, uh, great differences in terms of uh, the development cost, in terms of the operating cost, in terms of how money was being spent. Um, so we think that um, um, a more uh, complete uh, understanding and, and a more detailed understanding of the financial performance would probably help. Um, it would help to make better dis uh, decisions in terms of what is being financed by private sector means, what can be funded. Um, and we think that uh, we, uh, we have to make a strong plea uh, for that element. Um, the maintenance cost, for instance, uh, a lot of people complained about it uh, when, uh, when they were asked, and uh, I refer to terms industrial companies in industrial states. Um, but we had no clear uh, understanding of uh, how much money was being spent and whether there actually were budgets available. Um, sometimes it almost looked like uh, once the, uh, the lease was, uh, was collected, we could no longer find any, uh, any uh, cash flows, we could no longer find any uh, uh, reserves available uh, for future uh, handling. So uh, we think that there's uh, a need for more transparency, there's a need for uh, for a better uh, monitoring and, and reporting element. And all of these elements then allowed us to, uh, to come to uh, 
um, the, the main building blocks of our conclusions today, the main building blocks of our recommendations. And um, we've, um, we, we put up um, um, two nice formulas here, and those are not to be seen to be uh, uh, appearing in, in economic textbooks as of next year. No, they really are representations of, of the elements we already discussed. First element being that return on investment um, line. The equation there tries to explain that indeed with land value being just one component in the cost structure already as Fred explained, your return on investment or the return of, of, on investment that uh, can be uh, uh, obtained in a, in a malicious situation should be better than that return on investment in uh, the competing in those ideological international competing uh, locations. That's clearly one element. The second uh, element, the second equation, is the equation where we point out to, uh, to the situation of the industrial state developer. There's this price, and that clearly is the same thing as you see in the, uh, the equation above. Um, the price is uh, a component in, in the top line of the industrial state. Um, the, the, the price that he can charge um, to a particular type of activity, to a particular type of tenant, times the volume, the, 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 the quantity of land that is being leased out um, to that uh, particular tenant or activity, that clearly together makes, uh, makes the top line. And from that top line, we should be able to deduct all the costs, costs that relate to the initial creation of the industrial state, costs also that pre uh, relate to the organizations that are managing these industrial states, that are marketing them, that are maintaining them, um, and that should then be multiplied by the volume of land that they have created. And there, uh, I think when we see the element of, uh, of, of demand and supply match, we should not be creating supply which is 10 fold, 20 fold, 30 fold over the next 140 years of demand. No, we should be creating a volume which allows for choice, which creates the liberty on behalf of um, the, the investors to make a, a selection, to make a choice and to find that location which they feel suits best to their needs, but we should create, be creating that choice in a, in a restrictive way. Now, the cost and the, the volume related to the, the choice, to the supply that we put in the market, is clearly the second component. And then added to that, there may be a gap. And if there's a gap, um, we, we, we should continue to create the opportunity for the government to be involved and for the government to create um, um, uh, or, to, or to provide funding, but clearly the funding should not be the only effort, it should be financing. Uh, there's private sector um, loans, there's private sector uh, financing opportunities available in the market, and uh, the developer should be tapping um, in, that, uh, in, in that source as well. Um, there's more detail on, on, on these uh, um, elements in our analysis, and uh, We've uh, commented on a lot of these uh, different components. We've commented on a lot of the underlying uh, drivers in terms of cost, in terms of volume, in terms of top line. Um, and that allowed us uh, to, uh, to come to the final recommendations, which we uh, would like to share with you uh, after the break. We've been talking a lot. We can imagine if there's questions, there's comments on your site. And uh, we clearly invite you uh, to share those things with us. Um, but uh, if you allow us, we will uh, now take a break um, and then uh, come back to you with the uh, recommendations uh, after that break. Well, thank you, Fred, um, uh, for your and Jan. Um, that was started off with uh, emphasizing that you know, we should treat industrial estate as a business unit, you know, you, as a business unit in the organization or in the company. Um, Fred brings to you uh, his, his uh, experience, his perspective of what investors look for in industrial estates. And then to uh, walk through uh, with you uh, uh, walk through, uh, the, uh, the approach that we took in um, uh, undertaking the study. And uh, we look at the, uh, the uh, conclusions in, in three dimensions. We look at it from the policy dimension, we look at it from the attractiveness uh, dimension, and we look at it from the management uh, dimension. And uh, uh, finally, I think Jan uh, um, uh, walked through, uh, you know, uh, explained to you all the uh, conclusions that we made uh, from the uh, uh, six months that we had uh, time uh, for the study. 
And uh, obviously, I think uh, one of the uh, 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 main conclusion is that there is an oversupply of industrial estate uh, in this country. 595, we think, is too many for a small country like Malaysia. But oversupply means there are many dimensions to oversupply. It could be oversupply in terms of quantity, but it, it could be oversupply in certain areas. It could be sub oversupply in certain sectors and so on. So we really need to look at it. But unfortunately, uh, we, we, we do not have a very uh, complete database on all these things. And we will be working on it after, even after the report has been uh, uh, tabled to, uh, to the various uh, government agencies. We will be working on it and we will have to find a means, uh, a, a way to, to, um, uh, to populate this, this database uh, for which the consultants have actually given us a framework. Um, there, there are many uh, issues, again, uh, with the industrial estate, uh, which uh, Jan has highlighted. Um, uh, many things that, that we need to look at, pricing, um, uh, marketing, and so on. So uh, before we come to the recommendations, I will take this uh, opportunity to seek uh, your views on uh, the conclusions that we have come uh, you know, to, uh, at this stage and uh, give your uh, honest views on, on them and see whether uh, these are really valid uh, conclusions that we have made or they are off target or you know, uh, there are other things that you think uh, should be highlighted. So, so